listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. And I'm going to tell you something, people. You know, when I lived in L.A., the birds would wake up at like 8 in the morning when it was sunny, and you'd look out your window, and it'd be beautiful. But since I moved back to New Jersey two years ago, I swear to God, the birds come out at like 5 a.m., and it's so annoying because they wake you up, and I'm thinking, guys, it's still dark out. Please leave. And I told the birds to shut up the other day, and actually they did. But I think they got back to me, back at me, because my car, they went to the bathroom on it, and that's never happened in the two years I've been here. And I walked out this morning, and look what happened. Anyway, we have a great show today. We have a gentleman who has who's had a wonderful career. You know, he's a, he, he's a guitarist. He's played for some great groups. And my guest is Gary Peel. How you doing, Gary? Hey, Steve, real good. How about you? I'm doing no complaints. So, so you're, you, you live up in Massachusetts. Have you always lived in Massachusetts? No, actually, I started off in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, my parents got divorced. Uh, my mom went out west to California. My dad went back east to New Jersey. And uh, so I spent uh, some time with both of them. Uh, but I, uh, again, when it came down to it, they, you know, they said, well, where do you want to live? I said, well, California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, because those darn birds in the morning here. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, it's unbelievable because I lived in L.A. and I never heard them back. I, I grew up in New Jersey, you know, and I moved back two years ago. And it's just unbelievable. And I know you probably get yeah. the same problem up in uh, Massachusetts. I've got a woodpecker that starts at 5 <laughs> o'clock every day. <laughs> so... You know, when when did you start playing guitar, and, and what made you want to play guitar? Yeah. Well, I've got an older sister, and she would be listening to uh, Elvis Presley or the Everly Brothers or people like that, and they were playing guitars, and I said, wow, that looks cool. I want to play guitar, too, even though uh, I had taken a couple of piano lessons that just wasn't my thing. So when I was about 10 years old, my dad bought me a, a cheap acoustic guitar, and, uh, uh, you know, that was, oh, I loved playing that and learning how. And my grandmother actually even taught me a little bit how to hold it and how to play it, even though she was an organist, but uh, knew a, a, at least a little bit about the guitar and, and how to hold it. <laughs> uh, but then when I got to uh, high school, I was in a, you know, band there in high school, and the other guitarist in the band said, hey, there's this guy giving lessons in the next town over we should uh, all take lessons from him. And this is, of course, in California. And I said, okay, great. So we went down, and, and yeah, he was a great teacher. And again, it's not the best player makes the best teacher. You know, you have to really understand where your students are so you can communicate with them. And he was in a band called the Warlocks, and so we took some lessons from him. But a few months later, uh, he stopped giving lessons because they changed the name of his band to The Grateful Dead, and that was Jerry Garcia giving us <laughs> lessons. Oh, man, that's amazing. Now, let me ask you something. Taking lessons with Jerry, and when you took lessons, were they teaching you how to read music, or were they just teaching you technique, or, or what was his angle? Like, what, what was he doing for you guys? Yeah, it was by rote, as they say. So, yeah, we're, he wasn't teaching us how to read music because that stuff wasn't written down. You know, we wanted to learn, uh, like, Rolling Stones songs and stuff like that, and how do you play that solo? And none of that was written down in those days, you know. So, yeah, he would just teach us by ear. And, in fact, I remember walking in the, to his little, uh, you know, uh, student's uh, rehearsal space there, and he had a banjo in the corner. And I, I said, banjo? What's, what's that all about? And he said, oh, yeah, I, I love bluegrass and all kinds of music, you know. So... They really opened my eyes, like, oh, yeah, okay, there, there are other kinds of music, and you don't just have to be a rock player, you know. You can enjoy other stuff, too. Now, at what age did you feel that you were getting really good at guitar? I mean, I know I ask that to a lot of people, and they go, oh, I'm still not good. They're all humble, but you've been a musician forever, so you're good. <laughs> but at what, at what age did you feel like you're getting good, and you can, you can make this, you can make a career out of this? Yeah. Uh, well, you're right, uh, now, with my experience, I say, hey, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to get good. But uh, when I was in eighth grade, uh, I had a little band, and we played at the seventh grade dance. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. And after the show, girls would come up to us and ask for our autograph. So that was it, you know. <laughs> eighth grade, I figured, hey, this is, uh, is going to work out, you know. <laughs> 
Now, what was the music scene in your area as you got older? I know I read somewhere that you actually had a, a home a home recording studio, but what was the music scene when you were getting older and, and foraying into it, trying to get a job as a musician? Yeah, uh, luckily, <laughs> luckily or not luckily, whatever, <laughs> I was born in 1950, and so the music scene for me was great uh, in that there were places to play as, you know, a high school band. You know, you could play at the YMCA and, of course, you know, parties, but, uh, and they even had nightclubs that allowed teenagers in, so it wasn't just, you know, a drinking place because that was the time, you know. Um, of course, the, the Beatles really popularized, you know, that band scene, so they came out, you know, 63, so I was 13, and uh, again, there were uh, TV shows on primetime TV that were all about music, so, you know, sort of like the MTV of the day, except it was live bands playing. And again, the, the Stones would be on, or, you know, the Animals, or whoever, uh, primetime you know, 8 o'clock at night television of rock bands. And uh, again, places to play. And so for me, it was a great time growing up because that was available. And then as I got older into my 20s, uh, then, yeah, there were nightclubs to play at, and you could actually make a living uh, doing that, playing original music. You know, certainly if you want to play cover music, yeah, no problem. You could make a lot of money, <laughs> but you could actually make a meager living playing original music around the club scene and uh, you know our other buddies uh, were playing uh, the same scene as well so this was the san francisco bay area so you know we'd see eddie money playing at the long branch saloon and uh, huey lewis and the news would be playing at uncle charlie's and <clears throat> the tubes we saw them at the end of the beginning and katati and so uh, yeah all those bands were around doing that same thing that we were now, how did you start a home recording studio? Because it's funny, because, you know, you play in Alliance with Robert Berry, and Robert has a home studio, and I found that yeah. now more and more musicians are getting home studios, but you were very before that time. What made you want to get the studio? How old were you, and where do you even start when you make a home studio? Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, back then, well, <laughs> I guess I'll go back a bit. So in the 60s, early 70s, uh, if you wanted to make a record, you had to go into a real studio and pay money. Uh, but uh, in the mid-70s, uh, some uh, manufacturers started coming up with, you know, prosumer, you know, sort of uh, semi-pro gear that was almost affordable uh, to be able to record at home. And I gotta say, the guy that really put home recording on the map was Tom Scholes from Boston. So uh, he was, of course, a mechanical engineer, worked at Polaroid here in Boston, uh, and bought some real recording studio. He bought a, a one-inch 12-track uh, Scully machine. This is, you know, like prof professional stuff. But luckily, he was making enough money to buy that. He, he said he didn't have anything else, but he did have some recording gear. <laughs> And so that was, the, you know, again, the early 70s. And when his album, that first album came out, and people saw that he did this at home, he recorded that, you know, the biggest debut album selling ever in his basement. People thought, wow, you can do that? You know, you don't have to, uh, you know, spend all that money at $100 an hour at a recording studio. You could do it at yourself. And so, again, uh, companies started making that stuff. So it was, I'm trying to think what year... First, of course, I bought a, a, a two-track machine, just a stereo machine, and, and then another one, and bounce tracks, and then I got a four-track, and then once I joined Sammy Hagar's band, I bought an eight-track machine, and, and at the time, I think it was you know $4,000, which cost more than my Volkswagen Rabbit cost when it was <laughs> new, you know? So, uh, and, and so I, I, I bought that, and I converted my living room, I put up a wall so I'd have a studio room, and then you know other room, and just recorded, of course, my ideas, and, and then other friends of mine. And uh, uh, luckily, my wife, at the, you know, said uh, she didn't mind, you know, to have these musicians traipsing through our house, uh, because, of course, it was just something I loved doing. And uh, it, as it turned out, somebody from every band I recorded went on to be in other bands and make gold records. 
So, of course, the, the biggest example of that was Night Ranger. You know, we did a whole bunch of demos in my living room, one of which was Sister Christian. So I've, I've got the, you know, the demo for that that's done in my house. Now, how did you how did you meet up with Night Ranger? I know they were called Ranger at first. How did you how did you meet up with those guys? I mean, was it just word of mouth or? No, uh, the, the keyboard player Alan Fitzgerald was playing with us in Sammy Hagar's band, and uh, that's that's how it happened. So, when I joined Sammy in '77, uh, Fitz Alan Fitzgerald was a keyboard player. Uh, actually, Chuck Ruff was on drums. Of course, uh, Bill Church on bass and, and Sammy, and uh, but and actually one of the first gigs that we did was to open up for uh, Boston for the end of their first tour in '77, and then we did their whole second tour '78 through '79, and that's when I got to know those guys. But Fitz was uh, out, of, of course, in the band at the time, but uh, he left to put together a band. That turned out to be Night Ranger, and so uh, actually, when um, so I, I came back, I was on the road. I came back, and and we were going to then go on to Europe, and Fitz was in between the domiciles, and I said, "Well, gee, Fitz, once you you can stay at my house, I'll be gone, you know. And I have this recording gear in my house. If you want to use it, uh, you know, go ahead." And I, I trusted him because he was a very knowledgeable guy, and so he brought over the Night Ranger guys, and uh, started recording. And then when I got back, I, I helped them, and we, I guess, again, did a bunch of demos. So I met them through Fitz. Now, you play for Sammy Hager. How did uh, how did you meet Sammy? And were you were you gigging? You were probably bands before, but were you with bands before Sammy, right before you met Sammy? Were you touring at all, or, or what, was the, what was the transition into Sammy? Yeah. Uh, so I was in a band called Crossfire, uh, based out of Petaluma, California. That's north of San Francisco. And uh, we were a five-piece band. <clears throat> we had Mitchell Froome and his brother David Froome on both keyboard players. So we had two keyboard players in the band, uh, myself on guitar and uh, a couple other guys. And none of us could sing real well. <laughs> so we were always looking for a singer. And at one point, uh, when uh, Norman Greenbaum was making a comeback, of course, Norman had the big hit of Spirit in the Sky, uh, he was making a comeback, and he asked us if he could do some shows with us because he wanted to perform, and we were doing you know, all kinds of places. And he said, yeah, maybe we could do some gigs together. We said, okay, sure. So uh, we were doing a, actually a high school dance one time, and our band went on first, and we played our stuff, and stopped and then Norman gets up there and he was just playing acoustic guitar just you know singer songwriter kind of thing when he was playing and you could tell the audience was a little restless and so our drummer Steve Jones gets up because our gear was still set up behind Norman start, just gets up and starts playing drums along with Norman and of course Norman looks around and goes well what's going on you know and he looks over at us we're at the, you know off the stage off to the side and and we done a few gigs together, we sort of knew his songs, and he calls us up on stage, and we just started playing with him, like on the spot, no rehearsal whatsoever, uh, and just faking it, because we sort of knew his songs, and of course we knew Spirit in the Sky, and so we started backing up Norman for a while, but uh, we, was always, we were always looking for you know that great rock voice, and when our manager heard that Sammy had left Montrose, he somehow got Sammy's phone number, friend of a friend or something, and called him up. And, and Sammy said, well, I'm not really looking to join a band. I got a band, but I, I need to break them in. We've just, you know, I'm just putting this together. Let's, could I do some gigs with you guys? And so Sammy opened for us at a couple of club dates that we had done, and that's how we got to know him. And our band had been together for a while and, again, never got a record deal, never quite made it, and... So we were about to break up, and uh, again, our manager said, gee, why don't you try out for Sammy's band? I said, well, he's been through like six guitar players in the, in the last uh, couple of months. Why should I join? Him? He'll just kick me out in a couple of weeks, too. You know, what's the point? You know? So I said, well, why don't you talk to him? So I, I did get a chance to talk to him about it, and actually his last guitar player OD'd on cocaine in the bathroom of a gas station. And so he, he was asking me, he said, hey, Peel, are you into drugs? And I said, well, no, why? 
He said, well, and so he told me that story. I said, oh, my gosh, you know, poor guy. And he said, yeah, why don't you come down and jam with us uh, at the rehearsal hall? I said, okay, sure. So I, I go down there, and we're jammed on Sammy's songs. And Sammy's manager calls up and says, hey, there was a gig with Queen and Thin Lizzy. Queen canceled. Thin Lizzy's going to headline. You guys get open if you have a guitar player. <laughs> So Sammy turns to me and says, hey, could you do this gig? It's in two days. And of course I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, two days rehearsal with the band, and I, I'm doing the gig with them, and we actually had a second show. And, you know, I, I didn't know if I was in the band. You know, I, I just thought, well, I'm just kind of filling in, whatever. And after the second gig, uh, I said, well, thanks a lot. I guess I'll see you guys later. And, and Bill Church, the bass player, said, no, 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 you're in the band, you know. <laughs> That's it. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's how I got the gig with Sammy. Well, now you're playing with Sammy, and uh, you guys, you were on a lot of albums for him, and you played with him for a while. What was it like when you got a chance to do a big tour, and you said you'd open for Boston, and you got to do Europe? What is that like as a musician, going to another country? I mean, I've always heard that the other countries really accept American bands. I mean, it's something that they love them. What was that like for you? Because... It was a big tour, and, and Boston, as you said, had the number, you know, Boston was a big band. What was that like for you? Yeah, well, uh, we didn't tour Europe with Boston. We toured the whole U.S. with them. Uh, they actually went over uh, on their own. They didn't have a, they didn't take a U.S. opening act with them. But uh, we, uh, again, played all over the U.S. and, you know, huge places uh, with them and, and other bands as well. Uh, but but uh, the first time we went to Europe was we went to England in the late 70s, I want to say 79 or something like that, and it struck me that it was a different kind of scene over there. In England, their music magazines were very segmented about different styles of rock music, and so it had you know categories and listings of you know the the top groups in different categories so we were listed in heavy metal and so we said well heavy metal is that what we are i don't know i mean we're just a rock band you know this is in, with sammy right and so whatever okay we're we're heavy metal and i'm looking at the charts and there was like uh rock hard rock again heavy metal hard rock and rock and then there was what they called rock and roll I said, well, aren't we rock and roll? What's, what's rock and roll if we're not, you know? And I look, and it's, no, it's what we would have called rockabilly. It was the stray cats and people like that. Again, we would call that rockabilly for us, but they called it rock and roll. So, and the, the thing about the audiences were that 99% of the audience was guys. Uh, all had long hair, jean jackets, and their jean jackets were all plastered with logos of their favorite bands. They like sew on these patches of their the bands. I mean, I could swear they all looked exactly alike, and they were all headbanging to the music, right? And so, of course, that's infectious, you know. So they're like out there, you know, this whole crowd, thousands of guys are like headbanging to the music, and we start doing it too. We're on stage, and at the end of the show, we get off stage and go, "Oh, my neck is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this," you know. <laughs> But uh, they were very polite, and uh, at the end of the show, we'd usually sign autographs. And so we'd set up a table, we'd be sitting there, and they would file through very politely and, and wait for autographs. And uh, we would ask them, we'd say, hey, we're all the girls, <laughs> what's going on? And they, and they would say, oh, the, the birds, uh, they, they're good to see bands like Journey or people like that, but not heavy metal bands like you. And so it was so odd, you know, no girls in the audience. You know. Now, now, what was it like being, you know, performing? And Sammy is a very strong front man. That must make your job a little easier because, you know, everyone, you know, it must be easier when a lot of people are focused on him and he can encapsulate an audience. And then it's you guys just kick ass without feeling pressure. If you've ever seen Sammy perform, you know he's very energetic and charismatic, and yeah, he's the focus of the show, and it was just a lot of fun. He was always in a good mood, you know, that what you see is what you get with Sammy. He's always in a good mood, always, you know, ready to party, great musician, obviously a terrific singer, and so it was a lot of fun working with him, and 
he, you know, would say to us, he said, man, you guys are the best band in the world because anything I do on stage, you're right there with me. You know, like he could change the song, stop things, you know, do, do this other song, do, you know, anything at all. And uh, we, we were right there with him. So it, it was a great time. Now, you guys recorded, you recorded a lot of albums with him. What was it like then? Was it record an album, go on tour, record an album, go on tour? Or what was it like? Because it was, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s. As a musician, it must have been a little bit grueling. You're exactly right. It was. Uh, the only time we had off was when we were recording an album. And so, you know, as soon as you're done with that, then it's, yeah, hit the road again. And so, yeah, we were on the road or in the studio all year round. But, you know, we were young, and that's what we wanted to do, and so thank goodness we were able to do it. Now, you left, uh, the, the band broke up, uh, not broke up, I guess they dissolved, when Sammy joined Van Halen. Did you, did anyone know that was coming? I mean, was there talk, and were you guys thinking we, gotta, we might have to plan something else, or did it totally surprise you? Well, uh, Sammy had met Eddie there in 85 or whatever, uh, and Eddie had told him that David Lee Roth was going to, whatever quit or you know do a solo career or something and so they were looking for a singer and they offered it to sammy you know they'd seen him you know we had actually done shows with van halen before so they knew who we were and who sammy was and uh, so they offered him the gig and sammy came to us and said oh guys I, I hate to say this but i got an offer i can't refuse you know how could you turn that down you know uh Every year I was with Sammy, I was with him those eight years, you know, each year kept getting better and better. You know, we kept selling more records and headlining more places. And and he said, man, we were on a roll. You know, next year's going to be even better than this. But I got this offer and I, you know, I just can't refuse it. And I'm sorry, but, but you guys could just find some other singer and plug him in because, you know, you guys are a great band. And so we were on Geffen Records at the time and Geffen said, yeah, we've got this other guy named Robert Berry who had worked with Keith Emerson and Carl Palmer on a, a, an album called Three, and uh, we think he'd be a good fit for you. Well, as it happened, uh, again, because uh, when I was with Sandy, we had opened up for Boston, I got to know the guys in Boston, and Tom Scholes, the leader in particular, and he had heard that Sammy was leaving and whatever, and, and called me up and said, see, I, I heard... Uh, you know, Sammy's leaving the band, you know, you're out of a gig, would you come back to Boston and play on the one more song? We've got one more song to be recorded on our third album that we're working on. Would you just come back and play on that? Of course, I said, oh, absolutely. I, you know, I, I love the band, and, uh, yeah, I'm out of work anyway. So I left from Farm Aid uh, 1, which was our last gig with Sammy, and flew directly from there to Boston to start working with Tom, uh, he worked on the song, and after a couple of weeks, Tom said, gee, I think we really work well together. Why don't you move back here? We'll finish the album. We'll go on tour. We'll do another album. Who knows? Whatever. you know. And, of course, I've been here ever since. So I wasn't out of work for a day. I mean, I, again, flew directly from that gig to working with Tom, and, you know, how lucky could a guy be, you know? Now, what was it like getting to work with Tom? Because, as you said, you guys had the same interests with the home studios. You probably had similar personalities because you both knew what you wanted to do when it came to making Stone Studios. What's it like working with someone like that who really knows probably what you're thinking? You probably have ideas what he's thinking. <laughs> uh, I'd like to think so, but, uh, Tom, you know, Tom is a really special guy. When they put together those lists of 100 greatest guitar players of all time, he's always on there. But he's also on the list for 100 greatest keyboard players of all time. You know, that's him playing on Smokin' and Four Play Long Time and all that. So, and there's no nobody else in the world that's on both of those lists. And then you throw in, uh, you know, greatest rock songs of all time, you know, More Than a Feeling or some other Boston songs around there. And he designed the amplifiers that we use on stage because he's an electronics genius. So he's a really special guy. And it's been my pleasure to, to work with him all these years. Now... Well, you said you went on tour with Boston. Um, that was from support of the third album, the third stage. What was it like going on tour? Was that when did they still have the the big thing on stage, or what, what was going on? Yeah, uh, so it had been eight years since the second album that came out in '78. So here it is, '86, <clears throat> and uh, you know we're releasing the third stage album, 
And Tom had talked about it. I said, well, uh, you, at that point, only Tom and Brad were the uh, original guys. Uh, and he said, well, I, you know, I don't know. Eight years, that's a long time. I mean, you know how the rock business is. You know, sometimes 15 minutes is all you get, you know. So he said, you know, maybe there's still interest in the band. and we, Maybe we can do like a dozen shows or something. I don't know. We'll have to kind of wait and see. We'll, we'll put some shows on sale and see if anybody wants to come. You know, we, we have no idea. But that album went to number one, and the single, Amanda, went to number one. And so when we put the shows on sale, they sold out immediately. And so we, uh, you know, we're looking around for other musicians. One of the, uh, I had met Randy Jackson, you know, the, uh, who I had seen with uh, Journey, actually. And so I called him up and said, Randy, we're, we're going to do some shows. And Randy's a great guy, really nice guy, terrific player, right? I said, hey, we're going to do some shows. You know, would, would you want to play? And he said, well, how many are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to do at least a dozen. I, I don't know. It, it kind of just depends. Uh, we're not quite sure yet. And he turned us down. He said, no, I, I, I can't take a gig for such a short amount of time, 12 shows. You know, I, I, you know I'm working with Journey and stuff. I, I can't, uh, you know, I can't leave to, to do just that. So... I would love to uh, run into him someday. Said, so, Randy, what have you been doing in the meantime? <laughs> you know? So, but, uh, anyway, we, we found uh, David Sykes on bass, and he had been playing with a band called Aldo Nova, and I had met him before. And then another guy I had known from California, Doug Huffman. And as it turned out, you know, we did six months and broke records. We played nine nights here in the arena in Boston, and four nights in the Meadowland in New York City and, you know, all kinds of places. So the, the tour went very well. <laughs> well, so you the tour and the album did great, but once again, it was a long layoff until the next album. You know, what is that yeah. like for you when, you know, you're sitting there probably thinking, people love us, you know, we can sell out. I mean, we're doing amazing. Was that Tom who just had a writer's block or what, why would it take so long in between albums? Yeah. Uh, he is very, I shouldn't say slow, but he's very, um, what, what's the good word? Meticulous. Uh, uh, judicious in the studio. Like he wants, uh, and he, it's not that he doesn't have a lot of ideas cause he does. He's got a lot of musical ideas and wants to try them out and he'll, uh, you know, be very particular about it. You know, he, he's hardest on himself, I'm sure, about trying to get the right sound and the right feel for it. And he records directly to a master, you know, 24-track uh, tape at the time, you know. And uh, because he doesn't want to make a demo and then have to recreate it, because we've seen that happen the back when I was in Sammy's band. We would make demos of our songs, like just in his little home recording studio, and it would sound great. It was, okay, we're going to record these songs you know, for our next album. And we get to the real studio to record them. And sometimes they never quite sounded as good as that darn basement tape did, you know. And we could never figure it out, like, what's the difference? You know, it's the same players, the same song, you know. But sometimes there's that magic of just playing live, the whole band right there in the studio all at once playing that just clicks, you know, for whatever it is, the timing, the way you feel that day, you know. And uh, that's sometimes hard to, to recreate. And so that's what Tom was always looking for, is that magic in the studio. And he would, again, spend hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks, until years would go by of him trying to get that magic in the studio and work on songs for months and then throw it away. So, you know, it's just not good enough, you know. So, again, he's, he's hardest on himself when it comes to that. So you're with Boston. And now Alliance comes together. How did that happen? Was it because you had met Robert before, but then you left for Boston? Or how did you meet Robert again, and how did you guys start playing together? Yeah. Well, uh, again, after the uh, 87, 88 tour with Boston, uh, actually I went to start working with Tom Scholes at his electronics company, where, again, we made the amplifiers that we use on stage. Uh, so I was doing that because electronics was always one of my hobbies. And, uh, but he, is, he had said, you know, this is going to take a long time to make the next record. So if you have any, you know, any outside projects you want to do, go ahead and do them. You know, now's the time to do it. 
And so I said, well, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to wait four years or something because that's what he thought it would take. Yeah, at that time, he said, I figured this next record will take four years to make. And of course, I'm thinking, four years? My gosh, you know, the last <laughs> album I did with Sammy, we recorded that in 12 days. <laughs> so this is a different project. <laughs> so I said, you know, I, yeah, maybe I will try to put something else together in the meantime. So... I called up my old buddies from Sammy's band. I called Alan Fitzgerald for keys and Dave Lauser for drums. And Dave said, well, you know, the Geffen people had put us together with this guy named Robert Berry. Let's give him a call and meet together. Of course, I was living in Boston, but I flew back to California. And we actually got together in Sammy's basement recording studio uh, and met Robert there and started working on song ideas. And it was as if we played with him all our lives. You know, he was such a nice guy and we loved his ideas he liked what we were doing and just started playing and it just clicked you know so wow well, this is it this let's do this you know and that, that's how the alliance came together now is it was it weird not weird for you but it must have been a different feeling that you were starting a band from the ground up because you had had success with sammy you guys had toured of course you had success with boston because they're huge What's it like? Is there a, a little bit of trepidation or is there excitement or is there both when you're sitting there going into this new project? Even though you guys knew each other musically, it must be a um it must be a, a different feeling when you when you're starting from scratch somewhat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had gold and platinum records on my wall from both Sammy and Boston. And you're right, yeah. So like okay, starting over. <laughs> Nobody knows Robert Berry real well. Again, he had played with uh, Keith Emerson, but uh, it's not like they had huge hits and, and people knew who he was. And again, we're the you know side musicians. We're not Sammy Hagar, you know, and uh, or Tom Scholz. And so yeah, we're we're going to start over on this project here. But you know, that's <laughs> like I say, that's the the joy of being young and just saying, hey, yeah, let's do it. See what happens, you know. Uh, now, of course, for me. I still had the gig with Boston, so I, I didn't feel like I was quitting that to start something new. That would have been even scarier, right? If you're going to leave something that you know is, is happening for something that you know that's that you had no idea about. So, so that was uh, for me again not such a, a, a scary proposition. Now you recorded your first album in '97, I believe. What was that process like for you guys? Who did most of the writing? And it was, was it more equal share? Because, as you said, Boston had Tom Schultz, Sammy Hager had Sammy Hager. This is, you guys, no one was a standout superstar. What was that like when you went hit the studio and started creating the album? Yeah. Uh, as it happens, uh, Robert is very prolific, so he does come up with most of the songs. Uh, but the rest of us throw in some songs here and there, too. Uh, this last album, you know, I wrote a couple, Dave wrote a couple, even though he's a drummer, he's, he is a musician as well. Uh, and then there was a song that all three of us uh, just wrote kind of on the spot. You know, I had a guitar riff, and Robert had some lyrics, and Dave had some cool drum patterns and ideas, and so we just threw it all together. But, yeah, in general, uh, Robert's the guy that's, that's got most of the ideas. And, but we never wanted to do what some bands do, and that is to record in separate places. We wanted to get together one place, we're all in the same room, you know, call us old school, if you will. <laughs> but that's, that's for us, the, the, the magic, where the magic happens, you know, that we're all in the same room, playing the song, trying to work it out, trying to make it happen. And, in fact, I, I wish our fans could see that process, you know, that if we could have the fans in the studio watch us record an album, because that's, that's the most fun for us, is coming up with ideas, and, and again, no, you know, no egos involved. You know, when, when Dave, the drummer, tells me, oh, play the guitar like this, or put an accent here, or change that major to a minor chord, I do it, because I know he's got some good idea, and we try it. And not everything works, but when it does, again, it, it's really special. Well, you did, you did an album with Alliance in 97, and it looks like 99, and then not till 2008. What happened? Did you guys just go your separate ways? I know Robert you know, played with Greg Kinn and a few other things, but what? why was there that long layoff? And then, of course, you came out with an album just recently. But what was the layoff from 99 to 2008? Yeah. 
Uh, it, yes, it's because you know we got busy with our, our other bands. Uh, of course, Sammy uh, left Van Halen and started his own band again, and so uh, David went back with him. But he, even uh, when he was in Van Halen, he did some other solo albums that Dave played on. So uh, Dave was busy. Robert, uh, you know, did uh, Ambrosia for a while and some other bands, and of course he's got his own recording studio where he records bands all the time. So uh, between uh, me working uh, at the electronics company with Tom on, on amps and stuff that we're doing and uh, Boston touring uh, that we did there, yeah, it was a long time. We just didn't have a chance to all get together. Now, Boston, once that, that album, looks like that album that you said took four years, it probably took eight, right? That's right, yes. So what is that, what, did you just, I mean, you're working with Tom, but does Tom, was he keeping you, was he keeping you uh, abreast of what's going on, like it's going to be soon, or all of a sudden did he say, hey man, we're doing another album? Oh, no, it was a process all along the way. Again, uh, he started working on new material right away, right after that, uh, the third album. And so I would go over to his place and we'd work on some stuff. Uh, and then, he'd say, you know, I'd record something and then he'd say, okay, I'm going to work on this for a while. I'll give you a call. And then I wouldn't hear from him again for music, and, you know, like till six months later. But because I would see him uh, almost every day uh, at the electronics company that, that he had started, again, where we're making, the, you know, the amps that we still use today on stage. So, uh, you know, I love that part of it too. And uh, so we were, you know, working on other stuff, but again, he, he is <laughs> a little slow in the studio. So that album came out in 2002, and now with Alliance, you came out with another album in 2008. Was that because you guys all had open schedules? Yeah, just uh, it just worked out that you know we would all have some time together where we could again all meet and. Uh, San Jose at Robert's studio there and get together and work on stuff. And same with uh, this last album here too, Fire and Grace, that uh, we had worked on songs along the way when we had a minute and would get together. But uh, you probably don't know that Robert and Dave and I have another band together that is called December People. And Robert had come up with this idea to play traditional holiday songs but in the styles of classic rock bands. So we'll do a sound that sounds like, a song that sounds like the, uh, the Who doing Tommy, you know, uh, Pinball Wizard. And the acoustic guitar starts, tang a tang a tang 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 But instead of Pinball Wizard, we go, joy to the world, the Lord has come. You know? And, you know, uh, Santa Claus is coming to town like ZZ Top. You, know, you better watch out, you better not cry. And all, all other bands, you know, Led Zeppelin and Santana, and it goes on and on. And when Robert came up with this idea, I said, well, that, that sounds interesting. And he said, yeah, you want to do that? And I said, well, maybe. And he said, well, here's my idea, is that we do this at Christmas time. Every show we do is going to be a benefit for a local food bank or, or some other charity. And of course, I said, well, count me in. Let's do that. I mean, that, what a great thing to do at that time of year to, to help the folks that are less fortunate. So we've been doing that for nine years here. Uh, at, ju again, just a few shows there at Christmas time just to, to help out where we can. Now, the latest album by Alliance, how long did that take to record? Because as you said, you all go in the same studio, and as I said, I know Robert's very busy. And what made you decide this is the time to do that? Because your last one was 2008, and this is yeah. uh, 2019. So, so that's it. Uh, again, we had worked on some songs along the, <laughs> the years there. Every once in a while we'd have a chance to get together at Robert's Place and work on a couple here and there. But it wasn't until this last December that we did the December People gigs and we said, okay, let's take a, a week and finish up the songs we have and, you know, we've got other new ideas. You know, Dave brought in some other song ideas and I had a couple. And that's really when it all came together. Here's this, this last December that we all got together and finished up the songs we had and wrote some new ones and again fire and grace we just wrote on the spot you know and and uh, finished it up so that's that's when it really all happened for us well now being in the music business for such a long time 
How have you how have you seen the industry change? And is it easier for you guys to put out an album because you do have home studios? I mean, it's changed so much. How, how do you? What's your view on that as a performer who has was inventive enough to get a home studio early? It's certainly easier to record and to get good at the recording process, which is again different than working live in that uh, with you know in the studio when you're recording you're very concerned how this uh, sounds not only because you like the sound of that guitar sound but how does it fit with the rest of the band in, in the track you know uh, it's as you know not every instrument can be the loudest instrument or else then none of them are the loudest right so it all has to fit and work well together so that's been a good thing uh, as far as the technology goes, that now this stuff is accessible. I mean, if, if you have a laptop computer, you can record an album in your basement, you know, or a bedroom or whatever. Uh, so that's the good side. Uh, of course, the bad side uh, that happened along the way was record companies now, of course, uh, have been shut out of the whole system because uh, of file sharing, right? So now you can download your favorite stuff or you don't even have to buy records that you have Spotify or some other s streaming service where you can listen to all kinds of stuff and never have to buy anything. Uh, so uh, the record sales, of course, have uh, diminished quite a bit here over the years. So that has changed the dynamic of how bands make money. Uh, again, in the old days, it was you know selling records, and then you would go on tour, usually to support the record. And, and so those days in Sammy's band, that's what we did. We'd record and then go on the road, you know. <laughs> And gone, you know, 12 months out of the year, you know, and only come home to, to make the next record. But uh, uh, these days, that that income from recording isn't there. So the only way to make money is to go out and, and perform live. Unless there, you know, certainly there are acts that still sell a lot of records. Uh, you know, Taylor Swift or somebody, you know, sells millions of records. But uh, that's usually not typical run-of-the-mill rock bands like it used to be. So, back to, I'm going to go back to Boston. You know, they had an album, Corporate America, in 2002. Was was an album planned and then Bradley passed away, or were you? did it just take a while, or did that affect the group in recording? Uh, he passed away in 2007. So, we had done the Corporate America record, and... Uh, and also, and started on the, the last record, which was called Life, Love, and Hope, uh, before he left us. And so uh, he's on the newest track, although it was posthumously. I mean, we had these tracks recorded, and, you know, he's on there. So, uh, yeah, uh, but it was unfortunate. But, again, because Tom takes a long time to record, we had the stuff in the can already recorded. Now... Boston now, the last album was 2013. Is there anything in the future for Boston, do you know of? I mean, it seems like Tom takes a long time and, you know, he, he's a genius, as you say. Do you, is there going to be another Boston album? I think there will be. <laughs> uh, Tom's always working on song ideas and, uh, you know, sometimes even at sound checks will jam on ideas that he's got going. And, uh, yeah, he's very, uh, you know, terrific musician and prolific and great songwriter so I can't imagine him just saying one day oh, that's it I'm not going to write any more songs you know, I, it's just in his blood you know he's, he just does that you know uh, when is another story uh, so of course we toured four years in a row which was very unusual for us you know again sometimes it have been six or eight years between tours but we did uh, 2014 15 16 17 four years in a row and Finally, Tom said, you know, let's take some time off. So we took off last year, and this summer we won't be touring as well. But I hope we do next year, uh, and we'll find out pretty soon, because we need to start making plans if we're really going to hit the road next year. Now, what's it like when you hit the road with Boston? Because, you know, everyone knows. I mean, as you said, that first, I mean, you know, I can't. I can't drive. I, I have, in my car, I have regular radio at home. I have Sirius and, uh, and Amazon prime music, but you can't drive more than, a, you're not going to drive more than a day if you have classic radio 
a classic rock stations and not hear a Boston song. What is that like? I mean, what is the feeling when when you go into more than a feeling, which is just so huge? I mean, as a performer, what is that like? What's the energy like in the crowd? Yeah. Well, and that's what makes it special for us every night because people ask us that sort of the same question, like, well, do you get tired of playing those songs? Here they are 40 years old now, right? Uh, do you get tired of playing the old songs? And, and my answer is, well, I would if I just had to sit in my living room and play the songs. Yeah, I'd get tired of it. But you get up on stage and you start any of the songs and people just come alive and they, you look out in the audience, people are smiling and singing along, sometimes louder than the band, you know. And, that, you know, man, that's the best feeling in the world. So that, that's what makes it terrific for me. Now, how long did it take you when you started with them? How long did it take you to learn the catalog? You know, luckily they didn't have a whole bunch of albums, so you didn't have to learn a ton of stuff. But how long was it someone like you? How long does it take someone who's been a lifelong musician? How long does it take you to learn, like, all Boston's material? Yeah, well, uh, gosh. You know, as a matter of fact, when I was in a club band, I played more than a feeling. <laughs> so this was, you know, 76 when it first came out. I was just playing locally. And so I knew some of the songs already. Uh, and uh, once we finally said, okay, yeah, we're going to go on the road, then I got serious about it. But, uh, again, we were looking for other musicians at the time, so I had some number of months to do it, as opposed to the two days of rehearsal when I joined Sammy's band between the you know, two days of rehearsal, then I went off and did the first gig. <laughs> I, I, I had several months to get together you know, my act to, to do the first Boston show. Now, back to Alliance, you know, how do you feel about the, the, the latest album? Is it something that you, it's, it's what you envisioned, or do you think it's surpassed that? Or what's, what are your feelings about the album? I, I'm really proud of it. I think it's our best effort to date. And uh, because I have played with other bands, I always looked at my chance with Alliance as like, oh, here's a chance for me to have my own sound. You know, Boston, again, has such an identifiable sound. It comes on the radio, you know who that is, you know. And uh, But I didn't want to use the Boston sound for Alliance. You know, I wanted my own sound so that people say, oh, yeah, that sounds like Gary Peel playing in Alliance as opposed to Gary Peel playing with Boston or Sammy Hager days or something, you know. So it has taken me a while to really grow into exactly what I want my sound to be. And so at this point in our career, I think anything we do now sounds like Alliance because we really know where we're going with it. Whereas uh, like on the first album, you know, we were trying out a lot of things and, and not exactly sure what sound we wanted to achieve. We, we had some, I thought, good songs, but now, uh, again, we have that sound. Uh, that, that we think is ours, and so that, that's what we're really proud of. Now, from the earlier albums of Alliance until now, how do you think you've changed as a musician? I hope I'm getting better, uh, and certainly uh, my experience with playing with other bands and stuff has helped because I can see how d uh, better different songs are structured, and so I, I've got a better understanding of. Uh, again, how to play in a band with other instruments going on. And that's always the, a great thing. Uh, you know, again, as I was growing up, sometimes I was in a three-piece band, you know, just guitar, bass, and drums. And so anything on, on guitar, that's not interfering with anybody else whatsoever because I'm the only guy, you know. Uh, so when you're playing with, a, you know, other guys, other guitar players, like, okay, how are you going to work this out so that you don't interfere and you get the best out of out of both of them. Uh, Keith Richards from the Stones said that he and uh, Ron Wood, he said, neither one of us are the greatest guitar players, but the two of us are better than any ten other guitar players. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thought that was a great line, you know. And, and that's, again, the beauty of their band is that they really work off each other. Stuff is going on, you know, you know, nobody's necessarily just playing rhythm, another guy's playing lead. No, they're both playing these lead lines and stuff, and uh, that's certainly what we try to do with the keys and the guitars in Alliance, is really play off each other so 
not just a support, like, okay, you're doing backup and I'm doing the solo. No, it's like, how can we put all these together to, to get a unique sound out of it? Now, will you will Alliance go on a tour, or is it you guys are just too busy? I hope we do some touring. Uh, I have this summer off because Boston is not touring. Uh, I don't know about uh, Dave and uh, Robert, and we'll just have to wait and see. But we've certainly talked about that. We, we would like to do that here this summer. Uh, our record label, of course, is based in England, and we told them, they said, gee, you know, you guys have festivals over there just like we do here in the U.S. Let's get on one of those someplace because, you know, yeah, Alliance is not known real well. So we'd love, but we'd love to be a part of some festival where there, you know, be a lot of people there, and they're just there to have a good time. And and if we sound good, they're gonna like you, you know. So and and get a chance to see some of, of our other favorite bands and contemporaries and stuff too. So that's our dream would be to yeah, let's do some festivals here this uh, this year this summer. Now, do you have another? Are, are you guys planning another album, or are you just gonna wait to see this what happens here and how your schedules end up? Because it seems, you know, as I said, you know, just your luck when you planted another album, Boston will say, hey, we came out with a new album, you know, because you're in two bands. But do you guys talk about the future of Alliance in recording? Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, again, because we are uh, fairly prolific as far as writing the songs go, uh, that, yeah, we are, we're always working on stuff and... Uh, with that in mind, thinking, oh, this would be a great song for Alliance, or, you know, as opposed to, well, this would be a good song for Boston, or, you know, any of the other bands that uh, Robert's working with, too. But yeah, we certainly have a, a certain mindset of, yeah, this is what, you know, we, where we should take this, or this is a great riff for, that Alliance could do. So, yeah, we've always got a bunch of ideas, and yeah, I, I hope we... Uh, have that time again where we can just sit down and put them all together. Now, do you still have your home studio? Do you have one in Boston? Yes, I, yes, I do. Now, do and you so, do you work with newer acts, or do other acts still come in and work with you? I mean, what's the process? What's your schedule like in the home studio? Yeah, uh, these days, yeah, it's just my own ideas and working on other stuff. Like, uh, can't remember if I, I mentioned uh, All 41. Did I talk about that? No. Uh, this was a project band that the record label Frontiers put together. Uh, the last Boston album was on Frontiers Records, and so they called me and said, gee, we, you know, are you interested in doing an outside project? I said, yeah, sure, what do you got in mind? They said, well, we'll try to connect you with some other musicians and uh, put a band together and you know, do a, a, an album with you guys. And I said, okay, sure, what do you got in mind? And so uh, they connected me, you know, we talked with a bunch of different guys, and finally we ended up with uh, Terry Brock uh, as the singer, and he had been with Kansas for a while and some other great bands, and then Matt Starr on drums, who plays drums with Mr. Big. I know Matt. Matt's been on the show. Oh, okay, great. Nice guy, you know, and, and terrific player, of course. And so, uh, and so we were looking for a bass player, and... Some names came up, and I said, well, how about Robert Berry? <laughs> and they said, okay, sure, we'll use Robert. And so uh, the four of us uh, put together a band, and actually the folks at Frontiers had uh, one of their staff writers there had written a bunch of songs that they wanted us to play, and so we did those. But also Robert contributed two songs, and I contributed two songs to the album. So that came out uh, two years ago now, and you know did okay. But uh, you know it, it was a project band for Frontiers. So there, there, and so for that project, we were all over the country. You know, I think uh, Terry lives in Florida, and of course Matt in L.A. and Robert and up in San Jose, and me over Boston. So and that project, we never did all get together until we actually did the video for it, uh, the, one of the songs. But so we sent the and again the other uh, musician that played on the record was the keyboard player from Italy, uh, where Frontiers is based, and so he had sent tracks over and we all put our parts on that. So that's what I did and I did it all in my home studio here and, and the other guys of course the same thing. Well, that's awesome, you know, Gary. I want, I want to thank you for taking uh, the time to talk to me. Now, where can people find the latest Alliance album? Uh, Escape. Dot dash music 
Records.com is the record label, and I'm not sure how they are doing the distribution of, you know, probably Amazon or those kind of things, uh, you know, CD Baby or whatever, you know. Uh, I'm sure they could find it there somehow. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I don't know all the details about the distribution, but the, uh, again, escape-music.com uh, is, you know, you'll be able to find out how to get it from there. And your website is garypeel.com. Right. But people, just so you know, it's P-I-H-L. How many times have people screwed up your name? I mean, my last name's Cooper, and I've had people call me Cupper and Copper. With your name, how many times do people screw up your name? <laughs> it's about 50-50. <laughs> because, because an H and an I, you know, look similar, you know, the long uh, vertical line. And, of course, P-I-H-L, that doesn't mean anything to English-speaking people. They'll change it around to make it fill. Uh, and so I, I get Phil half the time, you know, uh, but it's Swedish. And so uh, when I run into somebody from, you know, Norwegian countries or whatever, you know, the northern countries, they'll say, oh, it's Peel, right? And I say, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, Gary. And people, go to his uh, website and check out his discography. Uh, there's a ton of stuff on there. It's great. And uh, listen to Boston. Listen to Alliance. You know, even go back and listen to the old Sammy Hager albums. So check out GaryPeel.com. Go to my website, CooperTalk.net. I have over 275, ep I mean, actually, no, over 725 episodes. You can email me, Cooper, at CooperTalk.net, Twitter at CooperTalk, and Instagram at CooperTalk1. So remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. And don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.